All right, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining us today. Today is World Press Freedom Day, uh, an international celebration of fundamental journalistic principles and an opportunity to examine threats to journalism around the world. The Courage Foundation has convened this panel for an in-depth discussion on the case of WikiLeaks founder, Julian Assange. Julian has been indicted on 18 charges, including 17 counts under the Espionage Act for the 2010-11 publication of the Iraq and Afghan war logs, the State Department cables, Guantanamo Bay detainee assessment briefs, and the video collateral murder. These are the first Espionage Act charges for any publisher, let alone a foreign national operating outside of the US. Press freedom groups and top newsrooms have widely condemned the Trump administration's indictment as an attack on journalism that would criminalize both publication of important information and of basic reporting activities such as journalistic such as journalist source communications. Today, Julian Assange remains in the high security Belmarsh prison in London, where he has been detained for over a year, as the Trump administration asks a British court to, ext to extradite him to the US to stand trial. To discuss the indictment and the dangers it poses to press freedom are two Pulitzer Prize winning journalists, both of whom reported on Edward Snowden's NSA revelations as well as a press freedom advocate who has been monitoring Assange's legal proceedings in London. Joining us is Ewan McCaskill. He is the former defense and security correspondent for The Guardian who covered WikiLeaks Cablegate disclosures in 2010. Ewan also reported on Edward Snowden's NSA revelations and he interviewed Snowden in Hong Kong as he sought asylum. Ewan has met Julian Assange twice in the Ecuadorian embassy and was involved in the, public, in the reporting on the Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. We'll be joined soon also by Barton Gelman. He is a staff writer for The Atlantic, one of three journalists who received the Snowden documents and author of the forthcoming Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State, which will be published on May 19th. And finally, we're joined by Rebecca Vincent. She is UK Bureau Director of Reporters Without Borders, which tracks threats to journalism around the world and publishes a press freedom ranking every year. Rebecca attended the first week of Julian's extradition hearing in London as a press freedom monitor. Welcome everybody and thanks so much for joining us. Rebecca, I'll start with you. Can you talk about why Reporters Without Borders, your group has been monitoring Julian Assange's case in particular and what is the latest in his extradition hearing? Sorry, unmuted now. There we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, so Reporters Without Borders works to promote and defend press freedom around the world. We're known internationally as Reporters Sans Frontières. So if I say RSF, that's why. Um, we believe that Julian Assange uh, has been targeted for his contributions to journalism, particularly contributions to public interest reporting. Um, so we have defended his case vigorously and looked to highlight it at every relevant opportunity. Um, I'll get into the trial monitoring in, in just a moment, but I wanted to, to mention the UK's ranking on our World Press Freedom Index, which just came out on the 21st of April. Um, the UK has slipped to 35th out of 180 countries, and that is in part because of the treatment of Julian Assange during the calendar year 2019. In particular, uh, the fact that he was sentenced to a disproportionately high 50 weeks for breaking bail. Um, the continued detention of Mr. Assange and the Home Office's decision to greenlight the, uh, the US extradition case, which is now indeed a matter before the courts. So we monitored the February hearing. That was the first week in the proceedings of the US extradition hearing at the Woolwich Crown Court in London, um, during which legal arguments were heard. I, I am not personally a journalist. I attended uh, as an NGO observer. This is something that we do in many countries, um, but the court did not make provisions for NGO observers. So how we gained access was actually queuing for the public gallery each morning. Um, and I know some, of, some in the audience will have been through that experience as well. It was uh, a very long and cold uh, morning each day to even gain access to the court. 
Um, and I want to note that I was joined as well by some of my colleagues from our international offices. Um, earlier in the week, our Secretary General Christophe de Roy and the head of RSF Journal, uh, Germany, Christian Meir, along with some other colleagues. Now that's important because I want to note, we treated it as an international trial monitoring mission. And that is unprecedented for us to do in a country like the UK. This is something we've done in other countries like Turkey, but frankly, to, to do that for uh, a hearing uh, in the United Kingdom shows uh, the level of concern that we have here. And, and this is not something that should be happening really in a, in a democratic country. Um, throughout the week, um, I was really alarmed by reports of mistreatment of Mr. Assange during that week, uh, reports of mistreatment at Belmarsh Prison, in fact. Um, he, the, the defense reported that he had been excessively strip searched, moved, moved holding cells a number of times and his legally privileged documents seized. Um, he did not appear well during, during the hearings. Um, in fact, the, the judge many times had to stop and check that he could follow and that he was okay to proceed. Um, for those who, who, have, you know, who haven't been in courtrooms like this or, or who may not have a visual, um, he was held in a glass cage at the back of the courtroom treated like a terrorist or a violent criminal really, um, and unable to, to really hear properly. Um, the public gallery, we were also in a glass box sort of up, um, so we could see him, but we were, um, we, were, we were across, so it was two panels of glass in the courtroom sort of in between. Um, what was really staggering to me in the legal case was the clear lack of evidence from the United States government for the things that it is accusing Mr. Assange of, and in fact, openly acknowledging that it has no evidence, particularly on the point that they, the, the argument that they make that he knowingly put sources at risk. Um, but because of, because of how extradition proceedings work, it actually may not matter in that, in that sense legally that they don't have any evidence. It may still be sufficient grounds to hand him over to the US for him to be prosecuted there. Um, I should note that we're really concerned about the charges brought by the United States, um, particularly under the Espionage Act. So this is a law that lacks a public interest defense um, that needs to be reformed and that it is now increasingly being used against whistleblowers and other journalistic sources. Um, this is something that has really been uh, increasing under the Trump administration. We have other cases that we're working to defend there. Um, but if prosecuted in the US, Mr. Assange would be the first publisher convicted under the Espionage Act, which would create a really distinctive chilling effect, I think, for, for journalists, for other media in the future that might think about publishing leaked information. So that's one of the reasons we're so concerned. Um, we think that this case will set an international precedent for better or for worse. It has really extremely dangerous implications for press freedom, for journalism everywhere. Um, and, and the legal proceedings continue. Uh, last week uh, was the first time I had ever monitored a hearing remotely by a, te by a telephone because of the lockdown conditions. Um, it, was, it was really not possible to adequately follow proceedings and I think that highlighted the risk of a full trial resuming in these conditions. And so tomorrow there will be um, an administrative hearing actually we're hoping that a date will be set that the, uh, that the three weeks of evidence that are uh, scheduled to happen next will take place not in lockdown conditions but where the press and professional observers can, can monitor normally because this case is clearly of extremely high public interest and for open justice it is absolutely essential that we are able to scrutinize proceedings properly. Um, I want to highlight as well our concerns related to Mr. Assange's health. Um, there have been a growing number of reports of COVID-19 uh, infections in Belmarsh prison, including reportedly the death of one inmate already. Now, Mr. Assange has a number of pre-existing medical conditions um, that the defense say put him at greater risk of, uh, of, of serious um, complications if he is exposed to, to COVID-19. So we're calling again for his release. Now, we believe that he should be released full stop, but uh, the health concerns presented by the pandemic actually increase the urgency of that, so he should be released. We continue to call on the UK not to extradite him to the United States. We continue to call on the United States to drop the charges against him. Um, and one point I want to make clear, and I'm happy to get into any of this in, in the discussion, but one thing is, I, I know it's a very complex case, um, and it surprises me sometimes how polarized opinions can be. I wanted to state that it's really not a position of weakness to change one's mind. And I'm saying that to the general public and I'm saying that as well to any policymakers who may be following because um, what one thought 10 years ago, what one thought two years ago does not necessarily have to determine your position forever in this case. 
Um, one of the most convincing arguments that I've heard on this was the UN Special Rapporteur for Torture, Niels Meltzer, who, who speaks pretty openly about how he changed his mind on the case, how he, how he was inclined to think one thing, and then the more he investigated um, the facts, uh, was absolutely convinced that, that Julian Assange is being targeted for political reasons, that he has suffered the consequences of psychological torture, um, and other extremely worrying points there. I think it is worth considering why we think what we do about this case, if the things that one might believe to be true are in fact true, why do we think those things, why do we not have other information? It's worth really vigorously examining that, especially to the media, especially to those who care about free expression and freedom of information. Now is really the time that we need to unite and really work for the defense of Mr. Assange, because regardless of what, what one might think of him or, or like him as a person or not, it doesn't matter. The implications for press freedom for journalism around the world um, are significant. and those who believe in these values must stand up now and speak out. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, and Barton Gelman has joined us and uh, he is a staff writer for The Atlantic and we'll come to him soon. But first, uh, Ewan, when Assange was arrested on uh, April 11, 2019, you tweeted this, um, terrible precedent if journalist publisher ends up in US jail for Iraq war logs and State Department cables, unquote. Can you talk about what that precedent would mean to you as a journalist who has reported on these very same documents? Um, you know, if Assange uh, is extradited to the US, uh, that will set a terrible precedent. Um, may I just say at the start, uh, echoing what Rebecca said, um, I, I, I'm embarrassed that the British uh, courts uh, are involved in this at all. Uh, and I'd hope that somewhere along the line, the British government uh, or the British courts find their spine and uh, uh, reject this extradition request. It doesn't seem very likely to me. Um, the idea for British courts uh, sending uh, somebody to a country uh, where he faces the prospect of uh, 170 years in jail for an act of uh, journalism uh, just appalls me. Um, the uh, I, I mean, part of the reason for this is the sort of close relationship uh, and intelligence gathering between the US and the UK. Um, Britain is heavily reliant on the US uh, for intelligence and it's desperate to protect that relationship. So whenever the, uh, America requests something, uh, then uh, Britain adopts this subservient uh, role um, and uh, you know, just plays ball. Um, you know, to answer your uh, question, um, I mean, what, what, if this happens, uh, you're basically getting the prospect of uh, criminalizing national security reporting. Um, I mean, Assange uh, and WikiLeaks, there's a debate about whether he's a publisher or a journalist. Um, a British court in 2017, uh, industrial tribunal, uh, not, uh, information tribunal, uh, looking at freedom of information requests by uh, an Italian journalist, Stefania Marizzo, on Assange uh, ruled that WikiLeaks is a media organization. So that sort of kills off that uh, argument. So if um, Assange is to be prosecuted, then the journalists at The Guardian uh, face prosecution. Journalists like Bart at The Post face prosecution. The New York Times, Der Spiegel, uh, El Pai, they all reported on these, uh, the 2010 diplomatic cables and the Iraq war logs. Um, I mean, one, one of the things that's sort of offen personally offensive about this is uh, journalists like Bart and others are protected, uh, constitutional protections in America. Um, like in Snowden, uh, it was Bart and uh, Glenn and Laura and myself um, uh, and others involved in that. As Americans, Bart and Glenn and Laura have protections. Uh, myself and other Guardian journalists uh, wouldn't. Um, 
And then just a final point, picking up on uh, uh, what Rebecca said about Assange's he health. Um, I haven't attended any of the court hearings, but when I saw him at the uh, Ecuadorian embassy last year, um, he was in pretty poor health at that point. I was only in the embassy for uh, probably a few hours. I went in twice. And uh, people have the misconception. They think of embassy, they think of a big building uh, with lots of rooms and elaborate staircases. It was basically a residen residential flat. It's fairly small, uh, claustrophobic, uh, oppressive. And the idea, I felt um, a sort of sense of depression after just sort of a couple hours there, what it must have been like, what it did to him mentally and physically, um, being in there for years. Um, you could see it uh, in him at that time. Um, I presume since he's ended up in Belmarsh Prison, he'll, he would have had access to um, uh, medical uh, treatment. But uh, um, you know, I still think uh, his health condition uh, you know, suffered as a result of his years in the uh, embassy. Thank you, Ewan. Um, Barton Gellman, Ewan talked about the criminalization of national security reporting um, under the precedent established by this Assange indictment. So let me ask you about how that pertains to your case. You were one of three journalists who uh, received Edward Snowden's documents uh, and you published extensively on those files. If the Trump administration would to apply the Assange indictment to other journalists, would you and the Washington Post uh, where you published so much on this uh, be at risk? Uh First, I would just uh, say, since we have him present here, uh, uh, Snowden gave uh, documents also to Ewan. Uh, as I understand it, he got the uh, some tens of thousands of GCHQ documents. So he was uh, very much involved in this directly. Uh, would I be at risk? Yeah, I, uh, that's not for purposes of other people's thinking necessarily the biggest question here. Uh, it certainly is a, a live question for me. The, the thing to understand about American uh, freedom of the press law is that it has not been strictly the letter of the law that has protected uh, American journalism and national security journalism in particular. Uh, it has been a sort of political legal consensus that there are some things we don't do. Uh, the language of the Espionage Act of 1917 is sloppy and extraordinarily broad. And it pertains to anything that could fit the definition, which is not defined, of national defense information. It doesn't even require that the information be formally classified. In fact, the classification system did not exist when it was passed. Uh, the innovation, if you want to call it that here, the, the, uh, the very dangerous innovation of the Trump administration is that it is for the first time explicitly charging that publication of national defense information for the whole world to see constitutes espionage. Now, it was already a grotesque enough distortion that sources of journalists were prosecuted for espionage as a consequence of talking to a journalist or of providing information to a journalist. Uh, that tries to squeeze uh, one thing entirely into another. Uh, when you talk to a journalist, you are hoping that the public at large will learn. Uh, you are most often motivated by your own idea of what is in the public interest. Uh, you don't want the information to be secret. You want it to be made known. If you're a spy, you were talking not to the public at large, but to one foreign government for the purpose of harming your own country uh, with the hope of keeping the information secret so that only this other spy agency has it. It's an entirely different transaction. Uh, but because we don't have an official Secrets Act, the US government has for several decades now, and the first one was Daniel Ellsberg, tried to prosecute sources who spoke to journalists. Uh, that is to say, if you had lawful access to classified information and you then, and which implies uh, a, uh, a promise not to share it with someone who doesn't have that, 
and then you tell a journalist, uh, they called that espionage. As I say, they didn't have another, they didn't have another handy law to prosecute it. Um, that has already been the subject of quite a bit of criticism. What's, what's new here in three of the counts against Assange is that mere publication by the journalist or mere publication by anyone, because it doesn't, you don't have to be a journalist. Uh, it, the, 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 uh, the debate about whether Assange counts as a journalist or counts as a publisher is irrelevant to this. Uh, the element of the crime is simply publication of national defense information for the public, for the, for the world to read. That is the crime in three of the counts in the indictment against Assange. That would be a complete game changer uh, and uh, extraordinarily dangerous. It was, a, it was a question that the Washington Post and its lawyers explicitly considered when we first got the Snowden papers. We talked among ourselves and with our lawyers about the risk that we could be prosecuted for publication. And the lawyer said quite correctly, uh, this has never been done before. Uh, the law is broad and sloppy enough that someone could try to make the case. We think it would be unconstitutional, uh, but we might lose. Uh, there's no guarantee that the, that, that uh, an appellate court, if, if Assange is prosecuted on this and convicted, no, no guarantee that an appellate court will say, you can't make it a crime to publish uh, because that has not been litigated specifically in a question like this. As I say, it has been a political legal consensus about what kind of society we wanna be that has prevented these prosecutions in the past. And uh, the Justice Department has crossed a big line by bringing this charge. Ewan, let me ask you, you talked about not having the same constitutional protections as an American citizen would. Has this case made you wary of possibly travel to the US uh, based on Assange's indictment? Um, I, no, I would say from the outset, um, you know, when it comes to whistleblowers like Snowden and uh, Chelsea Manning and um, well, Assange, is a journalist publisher. Um, I mean, they're, they're the ones that suffer. On the whole, uh, uh, journalists like me um, emerge from stories like this fairly un, unscathed. Um, one of the, when I said earlier about the, relation, the intelligence relationship between uh, the US and Britain, one of the peculi peculiarities of this was that the overreaction of uh, Britain to the Snowden story in a way that didn't happen in the US. Um, I think most journalists know that uh, officials from GCHQ, the British equivalent of NSA, came into the Guardian offices in the car park basement, uh, oversaw the destruction of computers on which the Snowden stories and uh, had been uh, written and filed. Um, you could never have envisaged that happening to the New York Times or the Washington Post. I mean, because of what Daniel Ellsberg and the Pentagon Papers, then you have protections against that. Um, on a personal note, um, I was put the government watch list um, and uh, every time I flew into Britain or arrived by train, um, I was stopped. Uh, I was never had anything like that in America, I flew in and out and nobody ever bothered me. Um, and uh, the counter-terrorism uh, at the Metropolitan Police uh, launched an investigation into 2013 into the journalists involved in the Snowden. They didn't specify who, uh, it might have been me, it might have been Glenn and Laura, it might have been Barr, it might have been the editor of The Guardian, uh, we don't know. It just said uh, into the journalists uh, involved. And that, the, it seems like extraordinary that it should be done under uh, the counter-terrorism -terror department doing it. And that investigation uh, was only shelved last year. Uh, it ran from 2013 up to 2019. And uh, it's been shelved. It hasn't actually been dropped. Um, but I don't think they want a press freedom battle with The Guardian or The New York Times or their Spiegel or anybody else. Um, what they've done is they've gone to the most vulnerable person and they see Assange is vulnerable 
partly for some of the reasons that Rebecca mentioned, is sort of lack of popularity. Um, you know, a, a lot of people in the right uh, disowned him early on. Uh, then there were the Swedish allegations. Uh, those, that case has now been dropped. Then a lot of people on the left uh, fell out with him because of uh, what happened in 2016 and uh, uh, Hillary Clinton. Um, so he doesn't have a lot of support. Um, so maybe they thought he was an easy one to pick off. The same thing happened during the Snowden affair. Uh, people were uh, carrying documents and files and uh, around the world. And the one they picked on was uh, David Miranda, uh, uh, Glenn Greenwald's partner. Uh, and uh, you know they argued he wasn't a journalist. So they, got, they go for what they see as easy pickings. The danger is that they'll come after other people afterwards. And, you know, speaking of the Swedish case, uh, Rebecca mentioned uh, Niels Meltzer earlier, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture. Well, he's looked into this case extensively and uh, his findings were one of the reasons he says he changed his opinion about Assange because he even accessed the original uh, Swedish uh, police files. And what he saw uh, in his opinion was basically a frame up job and a really a completely overzealous uh, prosecution, if you even want to call it that. Um, which is worth look, which is worth for people who are interested in the Swedish piece of this to look to look up what Niels Meltzer has written. Rebecca, let me go back to you. Um, in Reporters Without Borders 2020 World Press Freedom Index, the UK is ranked 35th and the US is ranked 45th. Uh, both rankings explanations mention the detention and prosecution of Julian Assange. How important is this case globally? And can you talk more about what it means to punish a foreign journalist uh, slash publisher for violating US laws or allegedly violating US laws? This case is extremely important internationally. Um, and one thing that I've noted in our work on this is there seems to be a very different uh, perception and position on Mr. Assange in the countries that are at the center of this, so the US and the UK versus other parts of the world. Um, there seems to be more interest by governments, by media in other countries in a more sympathetic way in, in many other countries than what we're seeing in, in the U US and UK. Um, I, I think that perhaps a reason for that is it, people find it hard to believe that their own governments could be responsible for basically political targeting of somebody in this way. Um, but I really want to emphasize that in a way it's that that lack of public pressure, that lack of public accountability on these governments that allows them to move forward in this way. So we have called it out in our World Press Freedom Index in both countries, as you've mentioned. And while the case is part of that scoring as well, what's happening to Mr. Assange is not happening in a, in a vacuum. We've seen really negative trends in both the US and UK for a number of years now. Um, I've spoken a bit about the UK already, but I'd like to go to the US because the record is even worse there. Now, 45th uh, was a slight, it was a slight improvement on the uh, ranking the year prior, but I wanted to note that the situation did not improve in the US. Um, the, the year prior, it was 48th, but that's because there had been a massacre in a newsroom, at the Capital Gazette newsroom in Maryland. So um, other trends continue to get worse during the year. And it was this hostile approach of the Trump administration towards the media in general. So I don't think it is unfathomable that others could be targeted in this way. And I think that the reason that Mr. Assange is being singled out in this way is precisely that chilling effect. Yes, he's more vulnerable, perhaps, than a journalist um, that's considered resolutely a journalist that is with an established media outlet. But um, I think it's very clearly intended to send a signal to those particularly that would uh, seek access to leaked documents and then to publishers that would in turn um, then disseminate them publicly. But I think what we need to bear in mind is the public interest implications of this reporting and that needs that needs protection. And I think we need to step in now before we have many more examples of this. It is not impossible for this to continue. And I think in fact, if they are successful, we will see a rapid acceleration in, in such cases, either that or complete chilling effect, widespread self-censorship, which um, would be in, in some ways even, even more difficult to counter over time. But I don't think it, it is going to be an isolated incident either way. Pardon, you touched on this earlier, but um, let me ask you to talk about it a little bit more. While many of the charges deal with obtaining the documents and conspiracy to publish, uh, 
there are three counts that specifically are known as, quote, pure publication charges uh, explicitly for publishing. Can you put these charges in a historical context and just talk about why they are specifically concerning? Barton? Can Bart hear me? I'm so sorry. I, I uh, <clears throat> my signal cut out for part of that. Uh, I, could you summarize the last half of the question? Oh yeah, just you know, three of these counts are known as pure publication charges, right. explicitly for publishing. So I was wondering if you could put those charges in a in a historical context and why they're so worrying. Uh, the historical context is there's never been such a law. Uh, there has never been a law that, that forbade publication. There was uh, an attempt to censor publication in the, Senate, in the Pentagon Papers case. These were historical volumes uh, that were classified information uh, that Daniel Ellsberg leaked first to the New York Times and then to the Washington Post. Uh, the US government uh, attempted to order those newspapers not to publish. Uh, it was the first attempt at, under First Amendment doctrine, it's known as prior restraint. Uh, and the Supreme Court, in a uh, mixed up opinion, uh, held that there could be no prior restraint, uh, that uh, the First Amendment sim simply allowed public full stop. There were, there were uh, concurring opinions, and I think it may even have been a plurality of the court that held that the inability to restrain publication in advance did not mean that you could not punish publication after the fact. Uh, we know that's true in, for example, in, in libel cases, uh, but there has never been an attempt to prosecute someone for publication of a secret because the government said it was secret. Uh, it simply never happened. And if it did happen, if, if Assange were convicted of this and his uh, and, and the conviction were upheld, uh, then it would be easier to take a less unpopular uh, protagonist, uh, black a reporter for the Washington Post, as I was for a long time, and say it's clearly established under United States against Assange that publication is a crime, uh, according to you know this or that citation, uh, and. Uh, Mr. Gelman has uh, done the same thing, took something that he knew was properly classified and he published it anyway for the world to see and thereby damaged the United States. And they, and they are presuming in the indictment uh, that publication uh, is done with the knowledge that it will, it will harm the interests of the United States. Uh, the presumption is supposed to come from the fact that it had a classified stamp on it. So there's simply nothing that would stop them from, publish, from, from prosecuting an American journalist, uh, you know, at the New York Times or the Washington Post or CBS News or anywhere else for exactly the same crime. And I mean, I, I say all this as someone who is emphatically not a uh, defender of Julian Assange in all respects. We have profound differences. There are many things uh, he's done that I don't agree with. Uh, I am saying that basic principles of press freedom are very much on his side in this case. You and uh, you were speaking before about the links between uh, the UK and US intelligence services. Are you familiar with the reports that the CIA used a, a Spanish company to spy on Assange inside the embassy? And if so, I'm wondering if you have any if you have any thoughts on that. Um, I just know a little about it. Um, uh, I think there's a court case uh, uh, underway uh, in Spain. Uh, uh, you're looking at that, um, but I think like lots of things it's been put on hold because of the coronavirus uh, and it's uh, been sort of, you know, it, it will come to fruition, you know, maybe once when the virus uh, dies down. Um, the, I mean, I mentioned that Italian journalist, uh, Stefania Marizzo, when she went into 
uh, see Julian Assange in the embassy. I'm pretty sure that uh, her visit, she was uh, was recorded, uh, and uh, so other prominent people who could then see Assange, uh, they were sort of secretly recorded. Um, so there's something to answer there. Precisely, I mean, the suggestion is that uh, these recordings are at the, at the behest of the CIA, but uh, um, I don't know if there's any firm evidence of that. I certainly haven't got it. Barton, let me ask you, I want to ask you about another charge, this where Assange is basically indicted for his communications with Chelsea Manning, and they accuse him of conspiring to try to crack a password. What are the implications to you of this charge for how journalists communicate uh, with their sources? That charge, in honesty, has, has the smallest implications for journalists at large. There's an important factual dispute, uh, as I understand it, between, uh, between the, the US government and Assange's defense about what he actually did. Uh, if, he were, uh, if he were tried and convicted uh, based on factual evidence that he uh, actually participated in uh, breaking down the digital defenses of a US government system, that would not be a charge for journalism itself. Um, from what I've read, uh, the evidence is dubious about whether he actually did that uh, and whether he actually made a difference or intended to make a difference in the uh, breakdown of the defenses. But, but the charge itself in principle is not the same as charging uh, him for journalism. Do you have thoughts on this about what the implications of the Assange indictment are for journalist source communications? Um, the, the world changed um, uh, after Assange. Uh, at, at the time, you know, people weren't engaged in encryption and a lot of journalists weren't tech savvy and uh, I mean, that all changed. Um, uh, after Snowden, uh, and now it's sort of natural for most journalists to use sort of signal and encrypted chat and um, all the things that Assange did, um, you know, asking people to uh, send information uh, to WikiLeaks. Uh, we, we all do that now. The Guardians get secure drop and New York Times do similar things. Um, so we, we, we've learned those uh, uh, lessons. The, my understanding was that, um, you know, like Bart, I think uh, I, I've seen no, nothing to suggest that uh, Assange uh, prompted Chelsea Manning, uh, was giving advice on how to uh, b you know, break in and get more material. It was, it was simply uh, talking about a, uh, how to protect his own anonymity. I, sh I should add uh, that uh, I, mean, I was speaking entirely about just now the, the password cracking allegation. Uh, there, there are plenty of other charges against Assange uh, that raise troubling questions uh, and that increase risks for ordinary journalists who cover national security uh, under U.S. jurisdiction. Uh, Assange is charged with soliciting and receiving classified information. Uh, that's what I do for a living. Uh, not always classified, but I solicit and I receive information. I ask questions and I hope to obtain answers. Uh, and uh, where there's evidence available, I, I try to get the evidence. Uh, so those are uh, inherently repertorial behaviors uh, that Assange was engaging in as well. Rebecca, do you have any comments on this? I think it's another example of an area that actually we haven't seen any evidence. And so that, that is the common theme throughout all of these charges against Mr. Assange is that there does not seem to be concrete evidence. The US government is aggressively targeting him uh, on the basis of things that it alleges he has done whilst also acknowledging that it has no evidence yet of such. 
Um, and that to me is where the UK dropped the ball. The government had the opportunity to stop this. The Home Office did not have to green light this decision. This does not have to be an, a, an active matter before the court, which it is now. Um, it was within the UK's power uh, to, to not accede to this request. They could have offered him protections or even allowed him to, to claim asylum in another country. Um, so I think it, it's, it's trickier now that it is a matter ongoing for, before the court, but we continue to call for his release. He should be released. He should not be handed over to the US to face these charges. Um, and just to touch on the allegations of uh, surveillance inside the embassy as well, um, it is extremely alarming to, to think that journalists' uh, devices could be accessed and interfered with um, in the manner that has been accused, and we will be following the outcome of the, the court procedures in, um, in Spain very closely. But I also wanted to note that some of the, the information that was also compromised uh, were his meetings with his own lawyers in that context, which is really concerning for the legal case that the, the US government possibly had uh, recordings of his own conversations with his defense team. And when you look at behaviors that continue, even as I mentioned in February, that, that week of the hearing at Woolwich Crown Court, reports of his legally privileged documents being confiscated by prison authorities, um, it seems that very at a very basic level, uh, his ability to, to have adequate defense um, is, is not being respected. So, and, and now that is one of the, re the reasons that the defense is also requesting for this uh, hearing to be adjourned is because they have not had access to him for over a month now in prison. Um, they're not able to, to meet with him. They're not able to discuss these things properly. And so they've argued that they're not sufficiently prepared uh, for, for the hearing to continue. So the legal defense aspect of this is, is extremely important as well, because at a minimum, he does deserve to have robust uh, legal defense. And these are things that will be examined on appeal if, if this carries on. Can I just pick up on Rebecca's point? Yeah. Um, I mean, the idea in Britain is that the courts are independent of the political system and supposedly the same is true of the US. Um, but the reality is these things are political decisions. Um, in 1998, uh, the Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet uh, was on a visit to Britain and there was extradition came from the uh, Spain. Uh, and uh, so they started extradition hearings uh, in the UK. Um, that was under a Labour government, and they felt strongly about what happened uh, in Chile after Allende. If Thatcher and the Tories had still been in power at that point, we'd never ha have had an extradition hearing. Um, and because Conservatives are in power now, um, if Labour were in power, maybe this wouldn't be going ahead. Maybe they would because of the closeness of the intelligence relationship. Um, but uh, maybe not. In, uh, in America, the Obama administration looked at um, uh, the Assange case uh, and decided not to go ahead with prosecution. Then Trump comes in and uh, they decide to go ahead. That to me smacks, suggests a political decision. I don't know what prompted them. Uh, WikiLeaks in 2016 or 2017 uh, released um, documents from the CIA, Vault 7. Um, and uh, I don't know if that was what sort of prompted them to come after him again. Let me ask Rebecca about this question. Based on the fact that the Obama administration already looked at the same evidence, decided against prosecution, Trump comes in and as you say, there is no new evidence and no even discernible evidence uh, from what you've seen so far. Does this qualify in the views of reporters Sans Frontières uh, as a political prosecution? It certainly makes it look political. Um, but I do want to say that the negative press freedom trends in the United States didn't start with the Trump administration. So the Obama administration did not have uh, a, a great record on on these issues either. In fact, some of the whistleblower persecution that we're still seeing ongoing started under uh, the Obama administration. Um, and the downward trajectory in our World Press Freedom Index certainly started in, those er in that era too. But uh, it is correct that Obama had chosen not to move forward on, on this case um, and Trump has uh, in parallel to other hos hostility towards the media. Um, a lot of, of cause for concern across the press freedom climate. And as I mentioned earlier, prosecution of whistleblowers under the Espionage Act. So this does appear to be uh, a really disturbing trend and absolutely one that is political. Barton, do you have any thoughts on this? Uh, Ewan talked about 
possibly the motive here on the part of the Trump administration being uh, revenge or retaliation for WikiLeaks publishing the CIA's Vault 7 documents. Mike Pompeo, after he became Secretary of State, uh, took a very aggressive stance toward WikiLeaks, calling it a, uh, a hostile non-state um, intelligence organization, basically. Do you have any uh, sense of, of what the political motive is here on the Trump administration's part? Uh, Vault 7, as you had mentioned, might be uh, the most uh, consequential of the leaks in terms of national security. Uh, there has been a feeling in the career uh, intelligence and defense services for some years, and uh, also especially in the uh, on, on the conservative side in American politics, that uh, journalists have gone too far, that old restraints uh, in terms of publishing classified information, uh, the, the days when journalists would hold back classified information uh, are gone, and that journalists have uh, have become much more aggressive uh, and much more frequently in publishing state secrets. Uh, there is some justice to that. Uh, there, there are a larger number of publications of state secrets. Uh, uh, Journalists no longer take the word of government as much as they did about what would do damage and what would not. Uh, albeit, uh, in almost all cases uh, among journalism organizations, we will still hear out the government uh, and hold back information that we are convinced is damaging. Uh, and so in the Snowden papers, there's a great deal that was never published, uh, not by me and not by anyone else either. Uh, there was feeling that there were things that should not see the light of day that would self-evidently do harm. Uh, but there's a sense that uh, journalists have been crossing lines and need to be pushed back. Uh, and so they've been happy to make examples of sources, try to cut off our oxygen. Uh, and now what is especially troubling about the Assange prosecution is that it is taking behaviors that are integral, normal, inherent in, and not optional for journalists uh, and criminalize those. And so uh, just to, I, I may or may not differ with Rebecca on this, uh, so I'm not sure I heard her correctly, but if the idea is that there's no evidence for any of the charges against Assange, I, I would disagree. And that's actually what makes them so troubling. Um, they're, seems on the face of it to be evidence that he received classified information uh, and evidence that he published classified information. It's all in, in the open public record uh, and evidence uh, in the indictment, if, if it's accurate, uh, that he requested the information um, from Chelsea Manning. Uh, those are all things that it seems to me clear he did. And those are all things that a journalist does. And it's the criminalization of those things, not the lack of evidence that, that troubles me. Ewan, let me ask you about the um, response of your journalistic colleagues. Do you think that there's been a sufficient level of outcry, especially from the outlets like The Guardian and The New York Times that have published uh, WikiLeaks's disclosures? Sure. Um, I mean, I've been really uh, disappointed in the response of the journalistic community and the US and UK. And part of the reason, I, I was in America at the time of uh, uh, publication of the uh, the cables. Um, and that's partly why um, I feel an obligation to take an interest in Assange now. Uh, we, we benefited from uh, those leaks. Uh, so I feel uh, an obligation to uh, you know stand with Assange uh, now. Um, in the, I phoned a friend in the US who's uh, usually quite, uh, you know, he's on the left, uh, liberal, uh, about a year ago and said, um, Julian Assange, I'd no sooner get the words out, and he says, don't I hear about it, don't, don't, don't I talk about him? Um, and there seems to be, I think Rebecca touched on it, real antipathy in the US uh, towards uh, Assange from left and right. And... Uh, it's maybe not quite as uh, polarized here, but there is a high level of uh, dislike for him 
Um, there, there has been a change. Uh, the Guardian and the Science fell out uh, soon after Cablegate. Um, but the editor at the time, Alan Rusbiger, um, as soon as this prosecution began and uh, he was arrested, um, uh, Alan wrote a piece uh, which said that uh, uh, he and Assange had fallen out and Assange really disliked uh, uh, Alan and disliked The Guardian. But in spite of that, uh, the, the, this case is too big. Uh, it's too important a uh, precedent. It is too dangerous for journalists. Um, and uh, so Alan was saying Assange doesn't deserve this and all, all journalists should uh, unite uh, against it. Uh, but sadly, we don't see uh, you know, much sign of lots of journalists coming on board behind Assange. Uh, I don't think they realize the threat. Well, what you need is uh, people in the streets, uh, you know, massive public support uh, outside the court hearings and lots of articles in the uh, media, lots of coverage on TV. Um, I'd hope that might happen uh, you know, once prosecution got underway, but there's very little sign of it in the UK. It's a sign to me that the demonization campaign against Assange has been successful in some in some respects, and that's why it's important to to push back on it. Uh, Rebecca, let me ask you uh, you about this. What's your sense of how uh, journalists have responded to uh, Assange's prosecution? I think it's very different country to country. Um, and so there's been a really robust interest, I think specifically this year um, around court proceedings from, from the continent, I think from Germany, from France, really uh, robust attention. Um, it has been a struggle to, to capture media attention in the UK. That's part of what I do in my job is even just trying to get our own materials out. Um, there does seem to be a bit of reluctance at a minimum to, to pick up the case. Um, it was the, the hearing in February was attended widely. In fact, the media annex was full and that included uh, journalists from the UK, the US and other parts of the world. Um, but it, it seems to, to pick up more robust reporting from elsewhere. I think in particular in television, there were, there were a number of um, Australian news outlets there. Um, I'm not sure that it even made, made any news coverage um, on in, in terms of television news coverage here in the, in the UK at all. And that's something that really would make a big difference in the case going forward is is just a bit more attention a bit more scrutiny a bit more sort of beyond just the immediate headlines on this um i think it's time that there, there is probably a bit of fatigue now from those who have stuck with this from for, for 10 years right but um a lot of the people who will cover this kind of thing now on their beat weren't involved at that time and i think there's a need for for uh, a greater understanding, at least even on a background level before we get into the hearing resuming. Um, and that will that will require really intense scrutiny. That's expected to be three full weeks of evidence. So that will be witnesses um, coming forward to testify and that will be really crucial. So I think one thing we would call for is for that attention for, for the media everywhere to pay attention to that and to report robustly and ask tough questions as well from, from both sides. All right, so we're gonna wrap up. And I'll just ask everybody to make some uh, closing remarks, whatever, um, whatever they want to impart with us as, as we wrap up. So Barton, we'll start with you. It, it's very simple. Uh, when governments overreach and they try to criminalize behavior that has not been a crime before, they always choose someone uh, who is uh, considered to be uh, uh, not a very sympathetic defendant uh, and they make uh, precedent that way, and the precedent damages everyone. Uh, so I do think that uh, whatever one's personal feelings about uh, Julian Assange, or even WikiLeaks as a whole, uh, the threat to press freedom in this case has to be taken seriously. Thanks, Bart. Uh, Ewan. Um, I, I said I was in a, a Washington when the cable gate cables were uh, leaked. Now, I, I went to the State Department the day of the leak, uh, Hillary Clinton did a press conference. Uh, and I remember she was really angry. Uh, and uh, the officials round about her were angry, uh, angry at the Guardian. Um, and you know, one of they were talking about, you know, the disruption and the danger to sources and that people would get killed. And uh, I remember the political reaction in the US, uh, people like Senator Lindsey Graham saying there'd be blood in our hands. Um, and the same thing happened after Snowden. 
and in in none of these cases uh, did this happen. Um, I, I, as far as, I mean, there was disruption, but as far as I know, no one uh, died uh, as a result of uh, the, the the cables that were released. Um, I think if they had been, uh, the US would have let us know about it by now. And uh, so you look at the other side of this. I mean, what, what were the because of the cables, we saw the abuses of the US and Iraq and Afghanistan, the relationship with dictators in the Middle East, uh, spying on the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, a whole host of stories that changed our view of uh, US foreign policy or at least confirmed the views we had. This was an enormous benefit uh, to uh, people around the world. Uh, it's been su suggested that contributed to the Arab Spring. Uh, the idea that Assange is going to be prosecuted for something that, you know, such a great uh, journalistic uh, scoop uh, is just totally abominable. And finally, Rebecca Benson. I think I would return to the point that I made towards the start, which is the idea of changing one's mind. Um, it really is a position of weakness. And I would urge everybody who has strong opinions on the case who may be predisposed uh, to not support this case, to question that, to seek out more information, um, to really challenge um, any preconceptions about this and to question what, I think, I think it was Ewan who mentioned earlier, what kind of society do we want to live in? Um, in whose interest is it if Julian Assange is handed over to the United States and sentenced to possibly 175 years in prison? In whose interest is it if he is left to die in Belmarsh prison with COVID infections all around him? Um, I am a dual national US-UK. This is certainly not what I would expect of either of my countries. And that's not the sort of society that I want to live in, regardless of what I do professionally or not. Um, and I would just encourage everybody to have a think about that and to, to be open to possibly changing one's mind. And actually one point there too, to, to those who have been involved in the fight for justice for, for Julian Assange this entire time too, to possibly be open to others coming over who haven't been there the whole time. Um, I think there is a need for broader support and attacking people who might not have always said the same thing or um, who may have a, a different you know, vision on some aspects of the case than th those who have always been with it isn't helpful at this point in time either. Um, what we need is more voices calling for justice in this case and for, um, for you know, our, our own obligations to societies to be upheld rather than sort of now looking at who's done what until this point and, and that sort of thing. And that includes the question of is he a journalist or is he not? I 100% am in agreement with the fact that that doesn't really matter. It's why has he been targeted and what, what is going to happen now? So I think a bit of understanding would, would help tremendously in that regard. I wanna thank our panelists so much for joining us. Uh, Rebecca Vincent, UK Bureau Director of Reporters Without Borders. Barton Gelman, staff writer for The Atlantic, author of the new book out this month, Dark Mirror, Edward Snowden and the American Surveillance State and Ewan McCaskill, the former defense and security correspondent for The Guardian. Thank you all so much. Thanks also to Nathan Fuller and the Courage Foundation for organizing this event. The Courage Foundation hosts uh, uh, Julian Assange's defense site at defend.wikileaks.org. So go there for all the information on Julian Assange's defense. Thanks everybody for tuning in today uh, and please stay safe.